Meredith, you want to get us started? Yes, I'd be happy to, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our very exciting training series. I'm Meredith Hatfield from NECPUC, the New England Conference of Public Utilities Commissioners, and we're very glad that you could join us today. I just want to briefly thank uh, the team at NARUC, Jessica, Danielle, and Tanya, who have done yeoman's work to put this together, and we're so pleased that many of you from around the country can join us today. And I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, and thank you so much, Lisa, Lisa, to you and uh, your labs team for all the work that you've put into this and all the great content that you've organized for us over this series. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, Meredith. I think we'll go to Tanya next with Nairuk. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya Pizlowski, and I am a senior fellow with the Nairuk Center for Partnerships and Innovation. If, for those of you who may not be aware, we have a ton of resources on topics just like this integrated planning work that you're seeing here, um, but on a number of emerging issues on our website that you can find on the front page of the naruk.org website. There's a Center for Partnerships and Innovations um, button, and you can, again, find just a, a myriad resources there uh, that you will likely find of value. So this is the first webinar in the electricity system planning training series that we've, as noted, as Meredith noted, developed with NECPUC. The, um, the training today is on coordinating distribution, transmission, and resource planning. And it's part of a long running series that started in late 2017 on this, you know, sort of in overall integrated planning topic. Recordings of our past, past sessions are available on the NARU website, and we'll be putting some links in throughout the session today to where you can find some of those resources. We need to thank the U.S. Department of Energy for their support of this effort today and this work that we're doing. We've teamed up with the Berkeley Lab and, and with Lisa to offer this training um, along with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. The presentation today is available now on the NARUC CPI website and Jessica will put that in the link in the chat so that if any of you want to follow along, you can do that. And the recording of this session will be available there soon after the um, event is over today. So again, you'll see that link in the chat and we'll put those in throughout the session. Also, you will receive uh, at least once at the beginning and once at the end, a link to an evaluation for these training sessions. And we really hope that you will take, it's just a few moments, just two questions if I understand correctly. Um, just take the time to fill that out for us. It really gives us the ability to make sure that these trainings are valuable for you and are timely. So if you don't mind, please helping us out by, by, taking, by taking that survey. And then um, you're also going to have a separate survey later this month for the entire series. So please, those of you who are participating, be on the lookout for that because we'd also like to get your view of the overall composite of the, the trainings that are part of this total session. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Lisa Schwartz from Berkeley Lab to introduce our speakers and as our session moderator. Thanks, Tanya. I'm Lisa Schwartz with Berkeley Lab. We're happy to re be returning to New England, at least in spirit, for regional training on electricity system planning along with NARUC and the New England Conference of Public Utilities Commissioners. Thanks for joining us for, from New England or another region. Uh, NARUC has made this available uh, to other PUCs and folks throughout the country. I wanna thank the US Department of Energy's Grid Modernization Laboratory Consortium, which supports this training. I also wanna thank NARUC, it's our land, longstanding training partner and our sister labs, the Pacific Northwest National Lab and National Renewable Energy Lab. This really is a team effort. Today is the first of six training sessions for the New England region and others running through June. And we'll put several links in the chat box. Um, first is a link to information, speaker bios and registration for the training. And you can register for any or all of the remaining sessions. Second, I really wanna highlight our training session tomorrow. We have four utilities 
three in New England and one in the Midwest, to tell us how they plan their distribution systems for the future. And tomorrow we'll start an hour earlier at 1 p.m. Eastern. So there'll be a direct rate registration link to that. Hope to see you there. And uh, I think um, Nayrik already put in the chat box a link to today's slide decks. So today we're talking about coordinating distribution, transmission, and resource planning. We'll be covering best practices uh, and potential improvements, both for New England uh, utilities and others in the context of distributed resources, grid modernization, and wholesale markets. We'll have Q&A after each of the two presentations. First one's about integrated planning focused on New England, and the second one is about integrating distributed resources into wholesale markets. I wanna urge you to enter your questions early at any time in the chat box, because when I'm moderating Q&A, it's gonna be hard for me to, to catch new ones. And let me introduce our presenters today. We've got Paul Martini. He's a thought leader and consultant on the business, policy, and technology dimensions of a more distributed power system. He's played a leading role in several states in their grid modernization efforts, providing technical assistance. And previously, he was chief technology officer for Cisco's Energy Internet of Things and VP of Advanced Technology at Southern Cal. Alan Cook is a senior economist at Pacific Northwest Lab. He's currently conducting research in the areas of system planning, batteries, benefit cost analyses for distributed resources and more. Before joining the lab, Alan worked at a utility for eight years. And Fritz Carl, he's an independent consultant and a Berkeley lab affiliate. He provides strategy and analytical support for regulators, research institutions, utilities, energy producers, and more. His expertise spans a pretty broad range, electricity markets, utility resource planning, regulatory economics, transmission, distributed resources, and rate design. So let's get started. Uh, first, we'll have Paul and Alan talk about coordinating planning in New England. Again, please type your questions in the Q&A box at any time. Paul and Alan? Thanks, Lisa. Next slide, please. So today's discussion, uh, Alan and I will cover uh, several topics. Uh, I'll go over the, you know, provide an overview of integrated system planning, the, the key elements. Uh, we'll also then focus on specific areas to consider for alignment uh, across resource transmission and distribution planning uh, that uh, you can start to look to, uh, to, to take action on. Uh, and then, uh, one of the key areas that we'll talk about is uh, really looking at forecasting and in particular load resources and climate impacts that, that Alan will uh, guide the discussion through. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is we, we recognize that integrated system planning processes uh, can be quite different or the implications or considerations can be quite different across the U.S. And uh, while the presentation here is more focused towards New England, we understand that others uh, from across the country are participating. So uh, even for those in New England, recognize that what we're gonna share are sort of general um, uh, uh, aspects that, that may be applied specifically to particular states and, uh, and jurisdictions uh, and, and market constructs, whether there's an ISO or not. So uh, hopefully this is useful, but it's definitely not a prescriptive approach. Next slide, please. So one of the key areas to really think about and, and what's really driving the need for uh, a broader system, uh, uh, integrated system planning is the fact that the, the needs of the system and the, co the, the considerations as we think about a modern grid and what we need in the power system, a decarbonized system that is also resilient uh, in the face of uh, climate change and, and, and related uh, you know, effects for weather, is to really understand the, the broad um, scope of, of those factors that come into play uh, that will influence planning and influence the operation of the system and what the system needs to support. So that increasingly uh, over the past few years uh, has included not only those dimensions from an integrated resource planning process that more fully uh, incorporate considerations of distributed energy resources, including energy efficiency and electrification, in addition to storage and, and, and solar and, and other uh, distributed renewables. Uh, 
um, but also those resilience dimensions uh, and the, the related threat assessments, uh, which we'll touch on. In addition to obviously other state and federal policies that are ongoing, affordability considerations. Um, and then increasingly we've seen in the past couple of years, a, a particular focus on the dimensions of local planning as those impact uh, distribution system planning uh, efforts and more broadly, uh, those uh, broader state and federal policies as may relate to economic justice, uh, but also alignment around uh, sustainability and climate action plans uh, that are happening at the, at the local level, at the city, county, uh, and community levels even. And so how all these come together uh, is the aspirational goal to, to look at how we think about that from, from, um, as considerations in the planning process. And that planning process, um, you know, it, which we'll talk about in, in go into a little more detail, incorporates thinking about um, those, uh, as we think about the grid in particular, those elements of asset planning, uh, what may be needed in terms of expansion and modernization, and that goes also for uh, resource planning, and then those resilience and reliability dimensions that need to be considered, which ultimately lead into needs identification and then ultimately solutions. Uh, that may uh, make sense, both uh, what may the utility may do, as well as what customers and and uh, and and other uh, other entities may be able to provide. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, one of the things as we talk about integrated system planning, uh, sometimes when we think about it, you know, really zoom out. Uh, you know, conceptually, it looks like the elements could fit into a, a logical aligned sequence. And uh, even in this context, uh, you know, which uh, Hawaiian Electric uh, proposed several years ago and is, is currently underway, um, this was still a fairly complex arrangement that they're doing. And, and, and obviously, in their case, they're a vertically integrated utility um, and uh, are able to manage the integration of some of these elements uh, a lot simpler. However, that has still proven, has proven to be a bit of a challenge as um, this structure has continued to evolve in terms of how things, uh, different elements in the planning process need to align uh, and various considerations of stakeholders throughout this process, as well as the commission's interest in Hawaii uh, to, to, uh, to be reflected through the, uh, the planning process and sequence. So even here, uh, it's, it's particularly complicated in a more simplified fashion, if you will, uh, or a simplified uh, structure where you have a single uh, utility that, that does all, all three elements, the distribution, transmission, and resource. Next slide, please. However, um, in most of the US, uh, particularly for those that um, have an ISO or RTO that, that is doing the uh, transmission planning, and in some cases, maybe also doing the resource planning uh, for a particular uh, area, say it's a state level um, uh, ISO, you can get a very complicated um, structure. But this is just for illustration. I'm not planning to, to go into detail on each of these boxes, but th this diagram came from the comprehensive system, electric system planning effort is one of the models that was uh, explored that Nehru and Nazio uh, pursued over the last couple of years uh, to understand the relationship and implications. Um, but as you can see, compared to you know, what uh, Hawaiian Electric was pursuing, uh, this is much more complex uh, given the number of entities involved. And this is definitely the case in New England as, um, as I've come to understand, you know, the various states, obviously, the various entities within states, then you have ISO, uh, you have different um, entities like uh, associated with the, the various governor's offices and the like. Uh, all involved in trying to uh, think about how to align various piece parts of distribution, uh, transmission, and, uh, and uh, resource planning. So it's quite a complex structure. Um, and what we'll talk about is really kind of take each of the phases that are identified here. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more about, well, this is complicated. Um, there are ways to think about where key uh, points are in this process to really think about where you might take action to, to, to try and achieve some level of alignment. Not perfect alignment, not perfect integration, but how to think about where you can, as a starting point, um, you know, find those key areas to, to address. Next slide, please. So um, there are really 
in that diagram, they're really sort of identified as four phases. Uh, and these are pretty basic phases um, in, in any planning effort. Uh, the first phase is you know, defining planning objectives and, and understanding the current system status as understanding your starting point for a planning process. The second phase is forecasting and scenarios definition. Uh, that is identifying what the inputs into the planning process, as we had touched on uh, on our earlier slide. Uh, the third phase is the detailed planning. That's the engineering and economic uh, analysis that goes into the planning process and identifying grid needs and, and resource needs, as well as then the potential solutions for those. And then the fourth phase is where there are filings, utility filings, or in some cases what the ISO might file with FERC, uh, and then the, the, the respective regulatory reviews. So for each of these uh, is a way to think about what can be done uh, in each phase to, to start to think about how to achieve some level of alignment. Um, and, and you know as I said earlier, uh, a fully integrated system planning process for any uh, New England state is, is probably uh, not a, uh, you know, would certainly be highly complex undertaking. And, and already many of you are, um, you know, have been taking steps towards uh, achieving some level of integration or at least alignment. Uh, but trying to have a perfectly aligned, perfectly integrated is probably not practical in the near term. Um, it's not to say that it's not aspirational. Um, however, as I mentioned before, it is possible to identify you know, key points in the respective resource transmission distribution planning processes to ensure one, consistent inputs and assumptions. Two, transparency regarding respective processes and the key points of interdependency and alignment that can be achieved. Uh, three, consistent consideration of operating criteria and, and conditions. For example, uh, you know those weather changes that are expected uh, or anticipated as a result of climate change. Uh, and then, you know, fourth, optimization of solutions to potentially address a greater set of needs. That is you know, the, the, the one stone, two birds idea that in many cases, some of the solutions we're looking at, whether, you know, utility or customer or third party can achieve multiple objectives. And therefore, how do we make sure across the tra uh, transmission distribution and resource planning that we can recognize that a single solution may be able to provide benefit across all three. And then fourth, um, there's also opportunities for state commissions to consider the interdependencies of various dockets that inform and are informed by integrated system planning or the elements of those, of those planning, uh, both resource transmission distribution, because that's another area for alignment uh, that can be quite helpful uh, in a process. So we're gonna go through each, each of these phases one by one and kind of explore a little bit with some examples uh, to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in terms of uh, phase one on policy objectives and system status, uh, what here, uh, just to clarify, when we say an objective, a policy objective, what we're looking at is a specific um, outcome with an associated timing and or performance criteria. Uh, so for example, objectives may include specific customer policy or business outcomes and the associated timing and or performance requirements these objectives inform what is needed by when and guide the subsequent steps in the process. An example might be uh, a certain number of uh, uh, a certain uh, decarbonization goals. For example, in the past, we had a focus on renewable portfolio standards, a certain number and quantity of, of uh, renewable energy uh, by certain dates. That, that's an example of objective, but that's just one. There's uh, many others that would come into play. Uh, system status, it, uh, this is the getting the assessment of the current uh, asset condition and operational performance of a system. Um, this is the essential starting point to determine compliance with planning criteria in any service standard. So one of the things that sometimes um, I've noticed in, in stakeholder discussions across the country uh, as we talk about planning, that, there, it, that, that part of the planning activity, which we're going to get into in step three, is really an end, starts with an engineering exercise uh, to determine whether um, the current state of uh, either the current state or what's being uh, forecasted will actually change um, the ability to meet these criteria, these service level criteria, operating criteria, the like, uh, or engineering criteria. And so uh, there is this engineering exercise that comes into play. <clears throat> 
Um, so, but understanding the current state uh, is really important. And this includes determining the current condition of grid assets. Uh, and, and this would also include resource uh, assets, um, the asset loading, asset utilization, uh, feeder and substation reliability. Uh, and these are done in relation to standards and operational performance criteria, as I mentioned. Um, this really requires effective data on distribution infrastructure, uh, also transmission, including relative age, current condition, and stress conditions. Uh, that is, how many faults and overloads may have occurred. This um, has implications on uh, how long life uh, certain um, assets uh, uh, may, uh, may have, for example, transformers uh, that experience a number of faults and overloads uh, conditions uh, reduces the, the life of that, um, of that uh, transformer. Uh, it can do that. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as we're describing uh, here, there's a couple of examples, um, you know, in the in the Northeast, uh, in particular New England, where on, on the right hand side, where we have uh, climate mitigation and adaptation um, goals, you know, some examples of, uh, you know, that would fit the criteria, you know, the, um, uh, sorry, the objective statements that we were referring to. So for example, in Rhode Island, net zero, uh, by 2050, 80 uh, percent below uh, 1990 by 2040, uh, and so on. Uh, in Maine, 80 percent renewable by 2030. These sorts of objectives are the kinds of things that planners need to to consider as input into the into the planning process. So, as you identify these, um, it's important to make sure that those are reflected in any planning process uh, and have been considered. Uh, in uh, in the analysis that's being undertaken. Uh, of course, there are other factors that come into play that we've already touched on. Um, but as we think about, uh, you know, uh, particularly on the resource side, things like fuel supply constraints and the like uh, come into play. Also, uh, which many of you are dealing with today, uh, thinking about transmission uh, uh, upgrades and, and extensions to be able to incorporate renewable whether off, offshore or uh, even um, uh, on land based, uh, looking at how that comes into play to be able to extend and expand um, or transition, if you will, the generation fleet from fossil fuel to, to renewable. Next slide, please. So in the next slide, this was an example that um, some folks I've worked with um, uh, in Vermont, uh, a few years ago, and, and they had gone through this um, process of identifying various policies uh, that uh, were, you know, potentially impacting from uh, what the planning process needed to consider. So that included things, uh, re not, re sorry, environmental objectives, renewable energy objectives, energy efficiency, transportation. Uh, these were a few of the key ones. And as you can see, there are quite a few. Uh, I'm sure this has evolved since then. Uh, I'm not current on where Vermont is on these policies, but the, so this is a bit out of date, uh, perhaps. So, but the idea is you want to be able to flag these and make sure these are taken into consideration uh, in the planning process. Next slide, please. So, Al is going to go into more detail here on on forecasting. I'm uh, it, uh, after I'm finished, so I'm just going to hit this at a high level. Um, uh, two, two important points. Uh, so first is one of the things when we think about integrated system planning is that we need to be able to align uh, both what the forecasts that are used in the resource planning process and transmission planning, uh, which is at a system level. Uh, but we also need to align that with what distribution planners use, which is a much more granular uh, forecast of, of load and distributed energy resource adoption uh, including electrification, and that that really uh, those two are needed to be able to then um, you know uh, well first of all they need to be aligned. So ideally those those distribution forecasts and aggregate comport with the system level forecast. Uh, but there's a fair amount of work at the distribution level to be able to do that bottom up analysis, and and Al will speak to that in, in, in more detail. The other is when we think about climate forecasts, and it sounds like from some conversations I've had with uh, some of some of you uh, in New England over the past few months that that you are also seeing uh, 
uh, pretty significant changes in forecast weather, including not just for resilience where we think about storms, but also increasing temperatures or changes or, or, or lower temperatures as may be the case, uh, where you're starting to see um, uh, not just a, a summer peaking, uh, but also a winter peak uh, that is that is similar to the summer peak. So a dual peak. Uh, this is not, you know, uh, what's happening in New England is not unlike what's happening in other parts of the country uh, where we're seeing um, long-term weather uh, implications uh, having impacts on how the system is operating and what the load profiles might look like and, um, uh, over time, really even over the balance of this decade. One of the things that's important when we think about climate forecasts is that they need to be downscaled. This is a process to basically transform climate forecasts, which are much broader uh, on a regional basis into uh, more low resolution environmental information or, or actually what uh, climate forecasts are, which are low resolution environmental information into high resolution uh, spatial and temporal uh, information to assess grid impact. So what's happening is in a number of cases, um, we've seen already uh, commercial capabilities to do this. There are a couple of firms that provide this kind of capability, this downscaling, and utilities have started to use this to basically assess the impacts on their system, uh, looking at these, uh, these long run changes in, in weather. So being able to be more predictive about what uh, the implications might be as they think about both uh, how, uh, particularly with electrification, how load changes may um, uh, evolve over time, as well as the resilience implications. Alan will talk more about this as well. Next slide, please. So as we as we think about scenario development, um, these obviously build on the forecast and, and start to look at, uh, you know, how you also factor in your policies and the like. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, you're going to want to think about what constraints or op opportunities there may be uh, if you can eliminate, for example, transmission constraints uh, for various renewable resource options. Um, also, what may happen with various, um, you know, resources in terms of their availability, uh, the technological advances, um, how that plays in. So in addition to the kind of forecast we were talking about before, you will also factor in for resource planning in particular, but also has implications for transmission and distribution, um, uh, these other factors that come into play. Uh, certainly as we think about range of potential outcomes with uh, distributed uh, resources um, and, and electrification, uh, and also then, you know, for example, what happens with uh, you know, existing uh, infrastructure, particularly existing assets, and what happens uh, if those do get extended, for example, the nuclear facilities uh, or not, and what that might mean then uh, on implication for other large-scale renewables uh, that you may need to then think about expanding and or uh, expansion of distributed resources, uh, renewable resources to, to make up the difference. So um, all of these kind of come into play and are there, there are also factors that should be taken into account within the scenarios that you develop. Um, also, as you know, as touched on, looking at these climate change impacts should also be included. And this is where it gets fairly complex because all of these are uh, combined, so they're not sort of one off. Uh, these scenarios should really sort of look at a combination of these uh, events uh, that may occur and how that then changes the implications for uh, the kind of system planning that you're you're looking to uh, uh, address. Next slide, please. So in terms of detailed engineering, I'll go quickly here. I think uh, most are, are familiar with this, but um, you know the great engineering analysis, as, as I mentioned, is particularly, it, these are based on the laws of physics uh, that ultimately uh, dictate the physical operation of this system. Um, and so the what's important here is that uh, first of all, there's some transparency, but the other is this is the basis which identify grid needs. Um, that is what incremental distribution or transmission needs might um, might be required uh, in addition to resource additions that you know that need a generation time, for example, coming out of the resource plan. Um, the other, as we get into the grid needs, this involves looking at specific situations where, there's uh, a need to basically address what may be from an engineering standpoint or operating criteria, uh, a need to think about 
changes that would mitigate what otherwise might be uh, uh, planning criteria or operating criteria that, that otherwise would be violated. Here, the most important part is really thinking about solution identification in addition to these needs. Where most of the discussion around the country gets into is the solution identification. So is it a, are there options for utility solutions, customer and third party solutions? And in particular, can we start to think about those that address multiple planning objectives across all three domains, that is distribution, transmission, and resource um, uh, as part of that process? And of course, uh, long and short-term planning are part of this, both looking at what may be needed uh, over a 10 to 20 year period, depending on whether your distribution, transmission, or resource planning horizon, uh, and then those things in the near term that are the action plans built um, that sort of align to that longer term uh, plan. Next slide, please. So here, um, the other option or opportunity, I should say, that, that we discussed at the outset was that there's an opportunity here for state commissions to consider the interdependencies of various dockets that, that inform uh, and or are informed by integrated system planning or the elements within uh, this comprehensive system planning that is the resource transmission distribution. So, you know, in, in the example, the sort of illustration on the side, and it's not there for great detail, but this was an effort um, that the Hawaiian Commission uh, undertook a few years ago to try and understand the relationship between various proceedings that had input into uh, the planning process uh, that I, I illustrated, uh, shared the illustration earlier. Um, as you can see, there were a number of different dimensions that all come into play. And while uh, I don't think they fully accomplished the, you know, the, the full alignment, I think there was a much better understanding of where the touch points were and which ones were most critical to think about. So while it, again, is one of these uh, areas where it might be aspirational, what can be achieved is, is having a a pretty good understanding of where the key drivers are uh, for the planning process out of these various dockets and trying to the extent possible, uh, look at where there's opportunities to try and um, it, uh, be, you know, inform the planning process and or be informed in a timely manner uh, for the respective docket based on where the planning process uh, processes will, will, uh, uh, will head. Next slide, please. So in terms of takeaways, um, Integrated system planning processes are aspirational, as I mentioned, but uh, and, and therefore, you know, not practical probably in the near term, uh, you know, at large. Uh, however, as I mentioned, there are key interdependent aspects uh, of the respective phases of resource transmission distribution planning that are ripe for alignment. Uh, so, in the planning and objectives uh, and criteria, uh, load resource alignment forecasts and assumptions. Uh, the grid needs and solution evaluation. And of course, as I just finished uh, describing, uh, there are opportunities to think about how regulatory docket interdependencies uh, are an opportunity to enhance the, the system planning processes and outcomes. And with that, I'll hand it over to Alan. Uh, thanks, Paul. If we could have the next slide. So I'm gonna be talking about load forecasting and DER forecasting and uh, some related topics. The load forecasting is one of those areas where the uh, where the uh, integrated resource planning or, or just the resource planning and the distribution planning intersect. We've been looking at uh, resource plans and in, in related documents going back somewhere close to 10 years, trying to identify what, what the advanced practices are. And a lot of this is, is drawn from that resource base that we've been developing over the last approximately 10 years. So load forecasting, uh, the advanced, the, the really advanced uh, analyses are based on really granular forecasts, uh, hourly forecast at a minimum. Some of them are now getting into sub hourly in order to, to study storage and, and other technologies that, that change perhaps dramatically at sub hourly. But at a minimum, we're looking at hourly forecasting. Because of the, the very aggressive goals that we have for, for greenhouse gas, especially uh, distributed energy resources, we really also need forecasts to be granular in space. We need to know by a circuit level, by transformer levels, you know, where are DERs going in? Where are they not going in? What are the problems that we have? What are, where are there opportunities? Where are there uh, bottlenecks? 
When you look at the high level resource plans, you, you do tend to see a lot of econometric load forecasts and a lot of end use modeling forecasts. Uh, when you start to get into the distribution planning process, you need to start forecasting that at a, at a circuit level. You start seeing other models like LoadSeer, um, SIMDIST, um, GridLab D coming into play. So you can see the, the picture in the, the bottom right corner here of a, of a distribution system. You know, so you can start mapping your load and where it's taking place to a distribution system as is shown there. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, it, in setting up for this training, we, we did take a look at some of the resource plans that are currently, um, that we currently find in the, the New England states. And in these resource plans, it's, it's a pretty good mix of econometric models, mostly econometric models with some end use models to build the, the forecast up. We do see a very good mix of, of granular load forecasts and granular DER forecasts. Um, some, some interesting um, and very up-to-date up technologies there. So let's move forward if we could to the next slide. I wanna get into one of the challenges that's facing the load forecasting process these days, and that is uh, climate change. Paul alluded to it uh, and, and talked about it actually several times. It's going to be an interesting driver. I was looking at some integrated resource plans for one of the various studies that we did not too long ago and looked at a natural gas IRP out of Vermont. And basically they showed heating degree days, which drives a lot of their load, their space heating load. Uh, they showed it declining over the, the IRP period. And, and that's what we're seeing with all of the uh, models these days is heating degree days are going to be declining. Cooling degree days, according to this map, is a little bit more of a mixed picture. Uh, in large portions of the country, cooling degree days are going to be going up, but there are parts of the country where they're either staying the same or, or declining. But what that means is if you have a system that has a lot of space heat on it, you're going to be seeing a, a huge decline in your demand because of that space heating load. And at the same time, a, a, an increase potentially anyway in your cooling degree load, which has the potential to really change how you do your planning. Uh, what we see from these maps uh, are that the New England states probably will see an increase in their summer demand. The overall uh, annual demand might or might not change. But I would note that this is based on an NREL report from 2015. So, you know, this is at least one, maybe two iterations now of global models uh, old, so it'd be interesting to see this updated with the new models. If we could move to the next slide, please. This is a, I, I included this because this is a real cautionary tale in, in, in my mind. This is from the Pacific Northwest, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council uh, for their recently adopted plan, their eighth Northwest Power Plan, looked at a load forecast based on historical data and compared that to one using downscaled climate data from those global climate models for the years 2020 through 2029. The, the dark, or the, you know, the black dotted line is the load forecast based on historical data. And you can see that the Northwest would be a pretty sharply winter peaking system if you base it on that 70 years of historical data. If you base it on the downscaled climate data, it's a summer peaking system. So that there are two takeaways from this that, that, that come to my mind. One of which is forecasting the future based on the weather of the past might not get you where you need to go. You know, If you just use historical data in this North, West example, you might be planning for a winter peaking system when in fact you should be planning for a summer peaking system. One of the uh, related takeaways from that is, at least in the Pacific Northwest, their resource portfolio includes a significant demand side resource. The economics of a demand side resource that's targeting a summer peak versus a winter peak will probably be different. There's certainly a lot of crossover 
if you insulate your ceilings and you put in double pane windows, you get impacts in both seasons. Uh, but the, the value of it is probably going to be different. So weather of the past might not get you to where you would need to be in the future. So if we can move to the next slide, please. I'm going to move to DER forecasting. I have a couple of slides on DER forecasts. It, 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 I, I'd have to say, if you, it doesn't, you don't have to go too far back into the past to find DER discussions and in, in resource plans that were relegated to an appendix at the back of the plan. Certainly, that's not the case anymore, especially in states like the New England states where you have such high greenhouse gas um, aspirations in terms of getting greenhouse gases out of your system. You need to have DERs and you need to be able to project them. Um, the, the most advanced resource plans that we're seeing these days are, are trying to build on historical information and build econometric models or maybe some vast diffusion models to try to estimate how quickly the PV and or other DERs will be adopted. So you can see at the bottom of the page here, some, some nice curves that were actually estimated in the Netherlands that show market uptake of PV and, and also electric vehicles. Each of the individual lines is, is at one region within the Netherlands and the darker line, the black line is kind of the average. We're seeing more and more tools like this, more and more tools like GridLab D or LoadSeer being used and the more advanced resource plans for projecting DERs. So I have more DER stuff on the next slide if we can move forward to that one, please. Uh, there are a couple of different approaches. One is kind of a top-down approach where you, you come up with a projection of DERs uh, for the system. And this might definitely might be the kind of thing that would apply to states like the New England states where resource planning is taking place at a higher level than just the electric utility. It might be good to top with, start with a top-down approach and disaggregate to the utilities and then have the utilities disaggregate it within their systems. There are a couple of different approaches that have been identified. And I'm drawing on a California document here that, that talks about disaggregating techniques and disaggregating it to the circuits or the other uh, levels within the distribution system. Hold on, I just had a window pop up in the middle of my screen here. One is based on load or, or other data that's available to the customer or the company, say the number of customers. I think that that one is not as good as some of the others, like a propensity model where you try to take that and disaggregate it to the various circuits based on zip code related data that you can get fairly easily from various governmental sources. Then you can actually model this based on uh, economics. And, and we are seeing that taking place in some of the more advanced planning processes around the country. Uh, e even better is an adoption kind of a model. Again, the best diffusion curve kind of model where if you have enough information, you can really start to, to build that up from the bottom and figure out what you need to do to get to that high level target that was set by the, the resource planning process. I do want to mention one thing, you know, data quality, data availability is one of the uh, limitations that we've seen brought up in, in a number of plans across the country. There are data sources out there. It doesn't necessarily always have to be your own source. For example, the New York ISO is, is relying on NYSERDA data for, uh, for some of their DER forecasting. So if we can move on to the next slide. Electric vehicle forecasts um, is another one that's going to be challenging the, the load forecasting people moving forward. There are a couple of different aspects to this, one of which is how many electric vehicles are we projecting for the system? And, and some of the same models, the propensity models or the best diffusion models are, are great for, for trying to get at that kind of information. And I do know I've seen some best diffusion models in some of the, the North, the New England 
documents. Electric vehicles are kind of uh, interesting because there's a, there are two elements. One is how many electric vehicles do we have, but also what is the energy usage or the load profile going to be? You know, are people going to be charging at home? Are they going to be charging at work? Are they going to be charging whenever they can, like when they're, when they're at the mall shopping, whatever it might be? These all have implications for uh, also when they're going to be charging. It, in a non-COVID universe, anyway, if people are charging at work, they're charging during the business hours because they're working eight to five in an office or maybe at a retail establishment. If they're charging at home, it could be at any time of the day. They could be charging at two in the morning to take advantage of time of use rates. The more advanced modeling that we were seeing are using tools like the Polaris tool developed by the Argonne National Laboratory that really tries to simulate the behavior of actual agents, individual people or individual, shall we say, types of people out there in the system to get a good handle on how much people are going to be charging and when they're going to be charging. Paul has already mentioned HECA, Hawaiian Electric. They, they are, their planning documents have a very interesting and, and pretty aggressive in terms of, you know, being right up to date kind of set of tools that they're using, including vast diffusion models to get at the numbers and the geospatial uh, distri distribution of it. You know, along with some of the proprietary load forecasting models, and one of those models I mentioned earlier, loads here. They're also using AMI data to get at actual historical profiles for, for charging, uh, looking at AMI data that is collected in other areas, like say California as well. So very, very nice looking set of models. There are also other sources of data that folks can turn to if, if you're looking for information. I know that um, one of the New England documents I was looking at um, made some heavy use of uh, electric, uh, energy information administration data, but uh, other companies are turning towards electric vehicle supply companies just to get information that they might have. So a lot of information out there and, and a lot of um, pretty, pretty nice tools in some of the, the more up-to-date and best practice kind of studies that we've looked at. So let's move to the next slide. I'm gonna step back a little tiny bit, uh, both in times and just in, uh, you know, at where I'm looking from. If you, if you look at resource planning in general, you, you really don't have to go again back too far in time to find that resource plans had had little or no visibility down into the distribution system. In fact, in most cases, the distribution system was plainly and simply being ignored in IRPs. Um, you don't have to go very far back at all for that to be the case. And behind the meter, you know, the, the resource planning had no visibility at all. But as, as more and more new generation is being connected to this, the distribution system, we need more and more visibility into that distribution system. I've talked about DERs and, and Paul may have done the same uh, as if it's just one thing, DER, you know, we're talking about DERs, but it's, it's a wide range of things ranging from distributed wind generation, people with what, what you might call backyard windmills, rooftop solars and then uh, solar in the middle of a city, you know, seven KW, 15 KW systems, rooftop solar with batteries, you know, community solar, big community farms located somewhere outside of town. It, it's, a, it's a raft of different things. So having tools where you can project what we're actually really talking about when we talk about DERs and where they're going into the system and what that means in terms of uh, are there bottlenecks, are there places where this, if we could get the DERs to go into this other part of the system, they would have greater value to the system than they do going into this area over here. All of this is, is data that, that feeds up to, to help, help us make those goals that we're shooting for. You know, it, it also helps in, in other areas. 
you might be able to look at the grid and say there's a lot of DER, a lot of rooftop solar going in over here, and there's there's no rooftop solar going in over here. And what does that mean? You know, it might be raising equity concerns. It might be raising other concerns. Some of those, um, as a as an analyst working for a regulator, you might think that's somebody else's. You know, you know that that's not something I have control over. But data, you know, it all starts with data. So those people, you know, uh, up in the policy making offices, you know, the governor's office or the legislation, legislative offices, the more data we have about what's going on, where it's going on, why it's going on, why it's not going on, uh, the more likely it is that we can feed the information to the people that need it in order to, to make this happen. Let's move to the next slide, if we could, please. This is an example of a, of a, of a distribution plan that, that really rolls in all of the various things I've been talking about, you know, really granular forecasts using some of the advanced modeling like Grid Lab D and some of the other open source simulation modeling for, for power flows, you know, that comes up with, with not only solutions, but non-wire solutions, you know, using Polaris for EV modeling. Yeah, if you if you were looking for an example of a, of a of a document that really really embodies a lot of the things we've been talking about, this is a great one. Um, let's move on to the next slide, if we could. And Alan, we need to uh, wrap up pretty soon here, so we can get to Q and A. Okay, I have a, two or three more slides, I think. So I'll, I'll pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so another intersection that we're looking at here is um, integrated planning and resilience. I I, I think that climate is going to be an impact uh, impactful both in terms of the planning resources and also the the funding you know so on, on one hand we're, we're planning for greenhouse glass um, reductions and getting der's into our system and on the other hand we really need to be looking at grid hardening and, and I have a, a few examples of grid hardening type of studies that are, are I think are are very much uh, shall we say top drawer, and I, I'm gonna leave it at that. I, I know that in the Northeast uh, New England states, there's also been a lot of grid hardening uh, work as well. Uh, I, I really point to the Con Edison study is what I think of as the gold standard for where we're going right now. So let's move it ahead one slide. I think I have some more uh, climate related stuff. Climate is gonna impact uh, all levels of the planning process. You know. Large thermal uses water for cooling. The warmer that water is coming in, uh, the, the, the poorer your efficiency is gonna be, the more likely you're gonna have curtailments. Um, we, we list here a few IRPs that we have noted over the last few years that have really started to look at climate change and how it's going to impact their resource portfolios. Uh, I, I think that to some extent, the Northwest Utilities uh, again, represent kind of a gold standard because they have really looked at downscaled climate data, how that impacts their loads, how that impacts their resources. You know, I give you two examples here, Tacoma Power and the Northwest Power Council, but Seattle City Light and uh, BC Hydro in Canada have, have also been working on this. It, climate's going to stress the system at all levels. Uh, let's move forward another slide if we could. I've already kind of hinted at data uh, being a limitation. You know, we've looked at a number of resource planning documents over the years that uh, where they haven't implemented some of these things and they cite the need for enhanced capabilities. Um, so yes, it's going to be a challenge and it's gonna be something that we're all gonna to have to work with to, to get beyond that, that challenge. There's another thing that's here that I, th I think is interesting and that's uh, just more, uh, probabilistic forecasting techniques. You know, going back to what I said about DERs, they aren't just one thing, there are a number of things. Having just one DER forecast is also not necessarily ideal. Having a number of DER forecasts would be even better, uh, even more ideal. So having, building the tools so that we can really look at, at more than just one forecast and try to hone in on what is the most likely outcomes uh, would be very helpful moving forward. Speaking of moving forward, let's let's go to the next slide. 
a takeaway. Um, distribution system planning of the past has historically focused on you know, safety, both workers and the general public and customer safety and meeting the customer's needs you know, for the quality of power, the quality, uh, the quantity of it and the reliability of it. Doing this for a fair cost. Uh, clearly those are still goals that we're, we're all concerned with, um, but with more and more distribution, voltage level generation, uh, we start having a lot of different feedback loops going on that we didn't have in the past. Uh, and we start having actually a new planning goal, I think, which is not just providing value to the customer, but extracting value from the customer. And finally, climate is just going to stress the whole system, whether it's the planners that have to start juggling multiple balls, uh, whether it's the distribution system or the transmission system or the generation. <coughs> you know, the planning to harden the system is going to have to go on at the same time as, as the resource planning. Final slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm, this is just something I'll leave you with uh, as regulators or, or as analysts in general. The next time you see a, a resource planning document or a distribution planning document, uh, some questions that you can ask. So, Lisa, I'm going to throw this to you. Thanks, Alan. And thanks, Paul. So I'm going to do a Q&A now with Paul and Alan. Um, and then stay tuned because we have on deck Fritz Carl, who's going to talk about integrating distributed energy resources into wholesale markets. Um, so, uh, Paul, let's start with you. Um, you know, you talked a lot about resilience planning, which is a particular interest uh, to all of us these days. How, how, how are utilities... Uh, and guidance from state commissions beginning to merge resilience planning with what we've seen primarily been uh, in distribution plans, the grid modernization and distributed energy resource focused. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And uh, maybe for context uh, for some folks, um, I, I believe we have another session coming up in another week or two, and I'll be going into that a little more detail. But uh, for here, um, what we've seen you know, over the past decade is as we've started to do more grid modernization planning and thinking about distributed energy resource integration and, and electrification uh, considerations, uh, we've kind of had a separate effort that's kind of always been there around asset planning. That is, you know, looking at aging infrastructure and, and the like. And a lot of that had to do with some reliability planning, although some of that crossed into the modernization dimension but this asset planning was kind of its own thing. And then about five years ago, uh, as we really started to see the impacts of, of climate uh, and, and weather related uh, storm events increasing in the severity, um, that, that asset planning became much more you know, involved in, in resilience planning because obviously there's a lot of basic infrastructure, you know, poles, wires, you know, uh, kinds of things involved. Um, but I would say in the last two years, we've seen a concerted effort by states and utilities to realize that we need to merge these um, as part of the process. And so what's, what's happening now is we're starting to see the initial efforts at trying to dovetail these into. So there's still some need to look specifically at the kind of climate change impacts related to, to severe storms. And, and then as, as Alan was describing, looking at that very granular to particular, you know, substations, feeders, transmission towers, et cetera. And then, and then look at that at the same time as so then you start to look at, and then go through that analysis and then look at the solutions, but then at the same time in parallel, do the sort of more modernization DR integration kind of analysis, and then be able to compare the solution set so that you develop a portfolio that that hopefully is optimized, where you're trying to find those, those solutions that can achieve multiple objectives, achieve resilience objectives, re, uh, address aging infrastructure, address modernization, you know, DER integration and the like. So that's, that's where we're heading. Um, it becomes much more complex. It's a, what's sometimes referred to as multi-objective decision-making, which I know some other folks um, at p are going to talk about in a couple of weeks, but uh, in more detail. But yeah, that's kind of what the current is. An example for folks is what um, Detroit Edison um, just submitted a couple of weeks ago, or, or, or a couple of months ago, I should say, uh, in their uh, integrated distribution planning and modernization plan uh, is kind of a you know a good 
uh, example of this early um, effort to to try and look at both both of those kind of planning analyses and, and integrate them at the distribution level. Thanks, and um, Alan, this is probably a question first to you, but Paul, you will probably have thoughts here too. Um, you know, some of the the best practice tools that you mentioned. Um, they may only be accessible to, um, to larger utilities uh, with more resources and maybe not available you know, to commissions directly or, or stakeholders. Um, are, are there examples of best practices or tools that can be adopted by the smaller utilities, you know, say you know, municipal utilities with a few thousand customers, and also just tools you know, that maybe other stakeholders and, and commission staff could access? That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, some of the, the things that, uh, that I'm most keen on these days, particularly related to the climate change, uh, I, I do think that there's a lot of data sets out there that, that can be used by the smaller utilities. Uh, it, it might take some, a little bit more work to use these data sets than, um, than it would if they actually downscaled their own data and, and specifically tailored it to, to work in their models. But I, I do think there's a lot of data sets out there like that that are, are very useful. And, and I did mention um, in, in my discussion that I had noted at least one New England study that had basically relied on some, some S-curves uh, from the Energy Information Agency related to um, the implementation or the adoption of, of electric vehicles. So I think there are a lot of tools, and I think that 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 your lab, uh, LBNL and and, and PNNL, uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and some of the other labs uh, like uh, Argonne and NREL and the DOE in general have developed quite a suite of tools that are available, that you know, at low cost or no cost to smaller utilities. So I, I think there's a lot of data sets out there. So I think so I we, we just need to make transparent, you know, some links. I mean, some of those tools have been gathered. Uh, right. So maybe that's something that we could get back to um, maybe uh, neck puck on and, and could share that. Um, Alan, I'll, I'll follow up with you after this. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add, Paul, to that? Yeah, I think as Alan said, there's two dimensions to uh, climate change. What, you know, as we think about, particularly at the distribution, um, one is obviously the potential change for uh, well, actual change that's it's, it's occurring with respect to load profiles and, 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 and the like that Alan illustrated, and I know is already happening in New England uh, on forecasts for, through the end of the decade. The other is looking at uh, weather severity, weather events, you know, resilience events. And there, um, you know, I think one of the opportunities might be, while you do at some level want to get down to the level of understanding um, you know, specific grid asset impacts, you can probably, for smaller utilities, let's say in Vermont, we have a lot of small utilities in addition to Green Mountain Power, which is, you know, obviously the largest, um, to the extent that, say, a large utility, you know, does that sort of downscaling, and it is not inexpensive, um, there's probably things that the smaller utilities that surround uh, Green Mountain service territory that might be able to glean from that uh, to understand how they can take regional or state level, um, uh, you know, climate forecasts and be able to sort of interpolate, you know, what might be implications for their system, um, you know, recognizing they're smaller, but they, they're generally neighboring a larger system that might have done that sort of downscaling. So there's probably ways to leverage some of that in, in a useful way. If, it, if it's made available. You know, transparent. Yeah, if it's if it's made available as part yeah, of the and and I think you know a municipal utility um, certainly um, could ask a larger, say, investor-owned utility, uh, and and maybe get some cooperation more readily. Um, mm -hmm. Let's let's move on. Um, you know, Paul, I was I was uh, um, is glad that that you sort of uh, mentioned that there are some limitations. Uh, for full coordination I mean, in an ideal world. You know, let's think fifty years from now you know, the, the software power that we might have, the data, the analytics, you know, they're all gonna be way better. But, you know, I mean, at this point, you know, there are limitations to integration across the different domains in the electricity system for integrated planning in New England or, or any region. Um, so, but what's a realistic goal for states to set, you know, in the near and, and you know, sort of like midterm to make progress towards this? 
Well, I would I would say that the first is kind of what we've spent a good part of what Alan and I addressed, which is the forecast. Um, you know, making sure that resource transmission and distribution planning are aligned on the the forecast, the inputs into that process, whether so not just load and, and, and sort of climate forecasts uh, and, and then distributed energy resources, you know, uh, you know, writ large, you know, as we think more broadly about what's included there, as Alan touched on, making sure that those assumptions uh, around that and sensitivities are consistent in each of those. Where we see problems is where what's being assumed at the or used as inputs in the distribution vary from what's in the integrated resource plan from what the transmission entity, let's say in this case, New England ISO is doing, uh, or even in New England where you have a separate transmission entity that, you know, owner that's managing, you know, maybe developing their own sort of, um, you know, views of what may be uh, occurring. If they're all if they're all using different inputs, um, you're gonna end up with, you know, outputs that you can't reconcile, right? So it's really important, I think, as a starting point to, to the extent possible, really identify those critical critical inputs that you want to make sure you're aligned on. Uh, and then from that, I think the other area is, is on the back end, which is once you get to the solution set, it's lo really looking for opportunities to not have, you know, multiple solutions that could, maybe one solution could have addressed multiple objectives. Uh, so, you know, some optimization there. Now that gets to be challenging because usually these planning processes, the timing of them, the cycles are different. And so, you know, these things come and they may be in front of different jurisdictions to be able to consider, you know, FERC versus the state or, you know, and the like. So, but to the extent possible, that those are the two areas I would primarily focus on in the near term uh, and particularly the inputs. So, so follow up to that really is, you know, if, um, as we know, um, the, the units within a utility are often really um, don't talk to one another. And in the past, you know, there've been some firewalls uh, because of competitive issues, but, you know, uh, there's been some recognition that there, you know, uh, that there has to be some communication. And especially with customer demand side resources, we're seeing more and more uh, utilities trying to open up um, and work across, uh, you know, business lines, which is really critical. But what do you say to like the distribution engineers who say that they have really specific reasons why their forecasts are super different for distributed resources and loads compared to, you know, uh, in a vertically integrated state, the the resource planners, uh, you know, how do you, how do you address that and how do you reconcile that? Um, let's start with Alan. I I think you start to address that first by by attempting to to disaggregate what what the planners are talking about, you know, because I, I I do think that it's really possible for the systems to be actually using literally the same forecast. But what they're presenting to you looks very different because the distribution planner is he, he or she is saying, I'm designing a system that's going to be in place for 30 years. And I want to make sure that it is going to be sufficient to meet the needs of the system for 30 years. And you, the, the resource planner, uh, are you telling me that uh, you won't shut that, that demand site management program off next year or something like that? So if I plan for a system that includes a demand side management program that goes away a year from now. Uh, I, I've got a problem. So I, I, I do think that there's a lot of, of things that if you just disaggregate it and look at the pieces, they match. But you, you, so you got to start with that point, which is the, that. And if, if they don't match, then the next question is why aren't they matching and how do you make them match? And that's where you start getting into the personality dynamics, whether, you know, this process has sufficient respect for this process to for them to be listening to one another and for them to be having a fair exchange of information and coming to a conclusion. So, so you have to start getting into that. Uh, but the first step is just disaggregating and just figuring out what's going on. Uh, Paul, do you have thoughts there? Yeah, I, just to pick up on Alan's sure. last point. I mean, the, the thing that that state commissions can do is is ask that question. Does this is what you're using as a forecast and for distribution it's disaggregated. So it may look different than what's in a resource plan or transmission plan, but ask them and, and by extension to the extent possible that the commission can ask the transmission planner and the resource planner why they're 
forecast may or may not be different or uses similar or not assumptions um, than the other. So ask each to compare and contrast, you know, uh, so not putting it on the commission to have to work that out, but ask the planners why and why they're deviating from what somebody else did. Um, so that that way there's at least a position that, um, you know, the commission can then assess, you know, what the differences are and whether they're material or not. Uh, or you know, be able to take action on what those differences might be. We're also starting to see requirements uh, in, in distribution planning from state commissions re requiring that reconciliation in the plan itself. Right. You know, um, which I, I mean, hopefully saving some time on <laughs> information requests later. All right, uh, let's do maybe one more question, get some quick responses. Uh, and then we, I wanna move on to Fritz Carl talking about integrating distributed resources into wholesale markets. Um, okay, so, you know, from my perspective, public participation is just so critical in these processes. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how how that can help with this coordination issue across the planning domains. Uh, Paul, let's start with you. Well, it so the, what we've seen um, over the last well, of almost ten years now of of in, integrating stakeholders into the planning processes. You know, uh, certainly we've had it at the transmission level on some basis. But at the distribution, we've definitely seen, you know, increasing use of stakeholder engagement in, in the planning process. It's, it's particularly helpful in when we're thinking about what the assumptions are around forecast sensitivities. And increasingly, you know, as Alan touched on, it's important to get subject experts in these particular um, areas around electrification, say transportation electrification. Um, we'll, we'll always have policy advocacy, but it's important that those folks that are actually, you know, those entities that are actually selling these services that are, you know, and particularly as we think about vehicles, integrating to the extent possible, those that are gonna be driving a lot of this change, uh, you know, at the table and part of the conversation. So uh, we've seen increasingly more of that. And this includes, by the way, communities and what they're doing around this. So for example, you know, I've been supporting Hawaiian Electric for the last six years on their integrated planning. One of the major factors is around bus, bus fleet electrification, you know, the public transportation, huge potential change in load uh, and implications. And having those folks and part of that conversation has been hugely helpful. And of course, as we see, as I touched on, you know, community level activities dealing with resilience, equity, uh, and, 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 and decarbonization are having significant factors in the planning process and having them involved is increasingly important. Thanks, Paul. Uh, any quick thoughts, Alan? Yeah, I, I think Paul touched on, on a lot of what I would have said. Um, the other thing that I would, would add, really kind of following on to his last point uh, with respect to equity is, uh, is you know, we as utility planners don't necessarily know how to talk to the entire world and know how to get the world to respond the way we do. So uh, oftentimes there are stakeholder groups out there that you know, if we're really targeting, trying to get DERs in all of our neighborhoods and not just the affluent neighborhoods, uh, there are a lot of stakeholder groups out there that know how to talk to constituencies that we, the utility planners, don't know how to talk to. So the more people you can bring into that stakeholder process, the more likely it is that you're gonna be able to, to find those people and meet your goals. You just slip back into your former role as a utility planner. That's right. <laughs> uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's switch gears here a little bit uh, and talk about, you know, we're, we're focused here on the New England region um, with implications for other, other regions around the country. Uh, let's talk about integrating distributed energy resources into wholesale markets. We've got Fritz, Carl, Again, he's a Berkeley Lab affiliate and independent consultant. Fritz? Thank you, Lisa, and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, so as Lisa noted, my portion of today's training is going to focus on DR integration into wholesale markets, or what I'm just going to refer to more simply as DER integration. Um, next slide, please. So we're gonna first go through a bit of background. What does DR integration mean and why is it important? We'll talk about barriers to DR integration and near and long-term priorities for how to address them. We'll discuss some key considerations. These are more like principles for utility commissions. And then we'll close by going through some questions that utility commissions can ask and thinking about how to identify and address barriers to DER integration. Um, so let's start with um, some background. Next slide, please. 
First, a quick definition of distributed energy resources. Um, per Alan's comment of, a, of a, a minute ago, I'm going to use the term DER to broadly mean distribution level generation, storage, and demand response and, load, and other load management. Second, by DER integration, I'm going, I'm going to mean in the integration of DER into both distribution system planning and operations and into transmission system planning and operations so that we can have these more coordinated investments and operations on the distribution and transmission systems. DR integration is not just about ISO wholesale markets. It also covers a wide range of other areas. DR interconnection, T&D planning, data access and communication, distribution system operations, and utility regulation and tariffs. We'll talk more about these in a second. But through all of these areas, the theme that I really want you to focus on today is coordination between distribution and transmission systems. If we don't have coordination, we're going to end up with high cost, reliability issues, and worsening inequality of higher income customers defect from the grid. This idea of T&D coordination is a little bit abstract. So let me walk through a couple of concrete examples of what it means in practice. Um, let's start with an operations example, looking at the figure on the right here. So say someday in the future, we have a significant amount of storage and responsive load on the distribution system in New England. We have a big generator outage and low wind in New York and a cloudy day in New England. What do we want our distribution level storage and responsive load in New England to do? Well, we want storage to discharge and we want our customers who can to reduce demand. Both of these things will reduce demand for electricity on the transmission system where we happen to be short of power and probably have high market prices. But how do we get distribution level storage and customers to reduce load when we're short of power on the transmission system? This requires coordination. We need our transmission system to be able to tell resources on the distribution system to reduce demand for the transmission system. And the way that we do this coordination is through a combination of incentives and direct market participation in ISO markets. We'll talk more about this in a bit. Um, at this point, what I really want you to focus on is the outcome, good operational coordination, having the transmission system and the distribution system interacting like they were a single entity. Next slide, please. Let's look at a planning example, focusing on resource adequacy and transmission needs. So say that customers in New England invest a significant amount of in, of, in a significant amount of behind the meter generation, distributed generation, storage and load management that just happens to be available during the ISO New England and New York ISO system coincident peaks. What should happen at the transmission, transmission level in New England in terms of investments in generation to provide resource adequacy and investments in transmission? Well, ISO New England should reduce its regional peak demand forecast accounting for the fact that all of these resources will reduce regional peak demand for the transmission system. And this lower demand forecast should translate into less required investment in generation on the transmission system and in, and in, the trans and in transmission infrastructure. And both of these things will reduce ISO New England's capacity market costs and its transmission charges. Most likely, DR investments in New England would also free up resources in New England for use in New York, so the New York ISO would also be able to rely on imports from New England to meet its resource adequacy needs, which would also reduce its capacity market costs. So coordination and planning between the transmission and distribution system can reduce required generation uh, investments and network investments in the transmission system at a regional scale. The converse is also true. We also have, if we have a surplus of resources on the regional transmission system, we should reflect that in how resources on the distribution system are compensated so that we aren't overbuilding the resources or infrastructure on the distribution system relative to what we need. So these are just a couple of, of concrete examples of, of T&D coordination and interaction. We can come back to others in the discussion if there's interest. Next slide, please. But if there's one single thing that best illustrates why it's important to get DR integration right, it's energy storage, and in particular, the placement of energy storage. We can put storage all over the electricity system, behind the generator meter, all over the transmission system, directly on the distribution system or behind the custom me customer meter. The question is not really where should we put it? Most likely we wanna put it everywhere. The question is how much should we put in these different locations? Ideally from a social planner's perspective, we're going to wanna to put storage where it has the highest value for the lowest cost. But the value of storage at the transmission level will depend on what's going on in the distribution system and vice versa. For, so for example, if we have rapid growth in EVs on the distribution system and EV loads end up being, EV load ends up being relatively price responsive, we'll most likely need less storage at the transmission level. 
In addition, what makes highest value at lowest cost somewhat complicated from a regulatory perspective is that it's important to consider value to whom and cost to whom. Uh, so customers may decide that they want to put batteries in their homes for backup power and then let an aggregator operate the battery in the wholesale market during normal conditions. In that case, part of the value, the value of backup power will be private and should be covered by the customers, but the batteries will also have some wholesale and maybe some distribution value. We we'll want to customer, compensate customers and aggregators for that value to give them an incentive to make those services available to the grid and not just to individual customers. We want DR to lower costs for all customers. So storage placement is a really useful lens for thinking about the larger challenges around DR integration. If we can get the incentives right and the coordination right, we'll end up with this well-functioning electricity system that has electricity storage in all the right places. But if we can't, we'll end up with too much or too little storage in some parts of the system. And as a result, we'll have higher costs, lower reliability, and higher inequality than we'd otherwise want. Next slide, please. Last bit of background. So there, there are two main ways in which we currently do coordination between the distribution and transmission system, at least in parts of the US with ISO markets. The first way is through direct participation by DR and ISO markets, either through aggregation or by larger individual resources. Um, and there's been a lot of attention on this mode of participation recently. This is what's covered under FERC Order 2222. The idea here is that um, DR aggregators or owners offer it directly into the supply side of the ISO market. So for instance, you might be an aggregator with 10 megawatts of supply and you offer it $20 a megawatt hour. This becomes part of the ISO supply curve. And the ISO is going to directly settle the DR owner or aggregator uh, for, for these services, meaning that the ISO is gonna charge them for things like imbalances and pays them for providing services. Um, but there's another and probably more widely used model for how DER participates in ISO markets, which is through the demand bids of load serving entities or LSEs. The, then these demand bids essentially reflect demand for electricity on the transmission system. So for instance, if an LSE has a thousand megawatts of load and hundred megawatts of distributed generation storage discharge and load shifts or reductions on the distribution system, the ISO is only going to see 900 megawatts of demand on the transmission system. It'll only see the net. In this case, the ISO is gonna settle the LSE for its electricity demand, and the LSE will settle the, the DR aggregator owner through tariffs and other programmatic incentives. We already do a lot of this kind of DR participation in ISO markets through utility programs and tariffs, we don't tend, often tend to think of it as market participation, but it's important to recognize that it is a form of market participation. Um, and in my opinion, if we can get the incentives right, it's actually a better model for DR participation in ISO markets than su the supply side, than supply side participation. That's a big if. Um, so when I talk about DR participation and integration, I'm going to mean both of these approaches to market participation. Just keep that in mind. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, there are a few key elements to DR integration, which are all interrelated. We have um, DR interconnection, which is where utilities will assess the DR impacts on the distribution system before they connect to it, uh, and whether utilities will need to upgrade the distribution system to accommodate DR growth. Um, but more broadly, interconnection is really the gateway. It's useful to think of interconnection as the gateway to the distribution system. We have distribution planning, which is where utilities preemptively build out the distribution to a system to accommodate growth in loads and DER. Um, so in other words, rather than waiting for loads and distribution level resources to apply for interconnection, we build out the system in advance for them. We have operation distribution operations and markets, which is where utilities ensure that the distribution system operates reliability in the future, perhaps at least cost. We have utility regulation and tariffs, which provide an important incentive framework for utilities and DR aggregators and owners. And then lastly, we have wholesale markets, which is where ISOs run markets to ensure transmission system reliability at competitive prices. We're gonna use this as an organizational umbrella for talking about barriers to DR integration and ways to address them in the near and longer term. But I want to emphasize that all of these elements are, are interrelated. So for instance, if we change our approach to DR, our DR interconnection, we'll also likely need to change our approach to distribution operations, distribution planning, and utility regulation. Next slide, please. By barriers to DR integration, I'm going to mean things that are hindering better coordination between the distribution and transmission systems. The high level categories of barriers here are going to map to our elements from the previous slide with one addition. 
Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to go through these really, really quickly, um, but we can come back and talk about them in more detail in the Q&A for areas where there's particular interest. The first category of barriers is DR interconnection. And I wanted to highlight three main barriers here. First is interconnection standards. So standards are meant to set out clear responsibilities for equipment manufacturers, developers, customers, and utilities. And here the key item is lack of widespread, the key barrier is lack of widespread adoption and implementation of the IEEE's 1547 2018 standard for interconnection and interoperability of DER. Um, the second item here is, is interconnection process enhancement and standardization. So for instance, in some states, utility interconnection processes still need to be streamlined so that the interconnection times can come down. And DER developers often face many different sets of interconnection rules across states, even within the same region due, due to a lack of, you're even within the same state in some cases due to a lack of uh, standardization. And then lastly, interconnection costs. Utilities need to come up with better ways for sharing interconnection costs, but they also need to start creating more flexible approaches to interconnection, meaning uh, flexible with flexible interconnection, meaning that utilities allow DER to interconnect uh, to the distribution system and avoid paying distribution upgrade costs in exchange for curtailing or otherwise changing DER operations during some hours. Second category is just here is distribution planning. And here I wanted to highlight two overlapping barriers. The first is TND planning coordination. Alan and, and Paul just talked a lot about this. And, but in, and in particular, something focusing on something that they spent a lot of time with this, which is this lack of consistent load and DER forecast. Um, but also in some cases, lack of coordination between distribution utility and ISO engineering studies at the TND interfaces. This is something that, that hasn't historically happened a lot, but needs to happen a lot more in the future. Um, second is coordination and regional resource planning, also something Alan and Paul talked about. Making, and this is making sure that everyone in the region is roughly on the same page about what consistent sets of scenarios about the future might look like. Next slide, please. For the third categories, distribution operations, I wanted to highlight two barriers. First, uh, DR overrides. This is the lack of clear processes and rules for distribution utilities to override ISO dispatch of DER. Um, this is a really important element of Order 2222, um, but utilities and PUC should also be thinking about this in the context of the longer term evolution of distribution operations. Um, and then the second barrier is the lack of clarity over that evolution. So lack of clarity over DSO functionality, distribution system operator functionality and grid investments. What are, what are the distribution system operators roles and responsibilities over the longer term and what kinds of investments in hardware and software do we need to get there? Fourth category is utility regulation and tariffs, um, both incentives for utilities to maximize the value of DER um, and also time bearing market-based DR tariffs that provide incentives to DR aggregators and owners for increasing DR value to the electricity system. Market-based here just means that the tariff is at least loosely aligned with what the utility or with what LSEs are paying and earning in the wholesale market. Fifth category is wholesale markets, um, and in particular, finding ways to get LSEs more involved in, in ISO intraday operations. So what's the, the, the gap between the day ahead market and the real-time market? Um, and this is so that the demand side can play a bigger role in responding to what's happening in the ISO transmission system over the course of the day. Um, and then the last category is more cross-cutting, overlapping and often unclear state for federal jurisdiction, particularly around the definition of and jurisdiction over distribution level markets. This is something I feel like we've been somewhat afraid to touch, but it's really, really important to start a conversation around this. Next slide, please. Um, so what can we do to address these barriers in the near and longer term? So the next two slides have a few priorities. Let's start with the near term. For DR, and I'm, or again, I'm gonna go through these really quickly and we can come back in the Q&A to discuss um, any of them where, if there, where there's interest. Uh, for DR interconnection, priorities include adopting and implementing IEEE 1547 2018. That's a little bit harder than I'm making it seem, but. Uh, nonetheless, it's, uh, investing in interconnection process improvement, improvements and at least some amount of regional or national standardization and interconnection rules, um, and then allowing static export limits for distributed PV press storage. The idea with static export limits is that a, in, as an interconnecting customer, you sign up for a maximum amount of power that you put onto the grid. 
um, but not on, on a time bearing basis, just on a on sort of a, a static basis. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A if there's interest as well. For distribution planning, the priorities are coordinating load and DER forecasts and developing these what if scenario analysis for the for regional resource expansion. For places like the Northeast which, that have a, a significant amount of retail choice, um, it's probably not, as Paul noted, it's probably not feasible to do a lot of integrated resource planning, um, but regional resource planning just to get everyone on the same page could be really important. Um, for DER operations, priorities would be developing uh, transparent, non-discriminatory approaches to DER overrides, and beginning to think about future models for distribution system operations and what their needed uh, grid investments would look like over time. For utility regulation and tariffs, the near-term priority would be exploring incremental improvements to utility performance incentives and a next generation of time-of-use-based time tariffs for DER customers. Um, and then lastly, for a state federal jurisdiction, uh, the priority would be establishing some form of working group on distribution market jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So longer term priorities build on these near term priorities. Um, for DR interconnection, we have more flexible approaches to interconnection. Um, and another way to think about flexible interconnection over this longer time horizon is through the lens of distribution con system congestion. So it's going to be really, really expensive to build out a congestion-free distribution system where we can accommodate all power on the distribution system at all times. So how do we allow the distribution system to have more congestion where we, where we have power that we might want to move from place to place, but in a, in a few hours, but we can't do, uh, but we can't move it due to reliability constraints. There's some really useful analogs from the transmission system that we can draw on to answer this question. For distribution planning, we have um, a shift from toward new planning criteria. Um, so if utilities start allowing loads and DR to come onto the distribution system before we before the utility can fully, before the system can fully accommodate them, how do utilities know when they should be making distribution investments? Eventually, we may end up with a similar set of criteria on the distribution system that we have on the transmission system. So on the transmission system, we have these three categories of, of planning criteria, public policy, economic, and reliability. Eventually, we may end up with a similar set of criteria and so similar approaches to, to multi-value planning uh, on the distribution system that we have on the transmission system. For DR operations, a priority is right sizing sophistication. So what make, might make sense for utilities with higher levels of DR might not make sense for utilities that have lower levels of DR. The question is, do all, of the, do all utilities need the same level of sophistication in their distribution operations, or can we right size sophistication somehow, even within the same state or jurisdiction? Um, for utility regulations and tariffs, we have creating open access rules for the distribution system, multi-part tariffs for DER customers um, that have more sophisticated time-bearing distribution rates and developing future regulatory and business model for utilities. This, this question of distribution rates is, is uh, going to be really, really critical for DER. And by distribution rates, I mean, how do we allocate the cost of the distribution system to DER customers? This is going to be really, really central for, for distributed energy resources. Um, and then lastly, for wholesale markets, we have some form of intraday bidding um, and then possibly LMP settlement for loads. But in general, the idea with, whole, the, with wholesale market designs over the longer term is how do we get to this place where we have the distribution system and demand bidding playing a more active role in how ISO uh, markets clear and how ISO prices are formed. Next slide, please. So there's a lot here, and this all seems really complicated. The question is, how can utility commissions effectively navigate and manage this complexity? And I wanted to step back and give a few quick considerations to help with, with navigation. Uh, the first consideration is starting from fundamentals. So taking a bottom-up approach rather than trying to use off-the-shelf models. So, so thinking through what is it that we want to do in, in this particular, in our particular area, rather than looking at what California is doing and trying to adapt it to local uh, conditions. Um, being really clear about terms and concepts, same, same issue, rather than taking concepts that, that, we, that we kind of think we know what they mean, being really clear about what we mean and defining them. Um, and then starting to develop a working framework for future distribution system operations. I think the clarity, getting clarity in terms of con in terms and concepts and, and, and approach is really critical um, because there's 
over the last five years or so, there's been a profusion of, of terminology around DR and DR integration and, and sort of how we go about doing this. And, and I think uh, that has, it's uh, not uncommon to find people using the same terms to mean different things. Um, second consideration is focusing on in the near term on least regrets changes. So what are the changes that will need to be made regardless of what the longer term future looks like? Um, third, while, while focusing on these near term least regrets, also maintaining a longer term perspective. What is it that we're working towards and how can we transition, transition toward that vision? Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, working together. Um, so DR integration is going to be really challenging uh, and utility commissions feel like, shouldn't feel like they need to go it alone or just follow whatever California and New York are doing. There's a lot of value in working together and working together in these larger groups um, to share experiences and, and kind of learn what other, what other jurisdictions are doing. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll close with a few key questions. As um, utility commissions navigate DR integration, what are the kinds of questions they can be asking? I have five, and these are these questions are all interrelated. Uh, first is, is what are the near-term gaps for DR integration in your jurisdiction? Second is how these gaps can be most effectively addressed, and that will vary across different jurisdictions. But again, there's, there's a lot that jurisdictions can learn from one another. Third, uh, third is what's the long-term vision for distributed system operations and distribution utilities uh, in your jurisdiction? Fourth is where clear federal state uh, jurisdiction might accelerate progress on DR integration in the near and longer term. Um, and then fifth and lastly is where there might be opportunities for working together and what the right balance between regional and national fora for collaboration might be. Next slide, please. Um, so I have some additional reading on this slide. Some of this is from recent efforts by the Energy System Integration Group and also Grid Lab and Advanced Energy Economy. But a lot of this deals, a lot of the reading here deals with, with provides more detail on some of the concepts that I've, I've gone through today. Uh, next slide, please. And so with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, we have contact informi for information here for any follow-up questions that, that don't get addressed in the Q&A. Um, and I'll thank you for time. And I think we'll move to, to questions. Thanks, Chris. That was really good. Um, I have a lot of questions, as I always do for you, but um, I'm going to start with something um, I, I had sort of hinted at in, in we, when we were communicating about your presentation. Um, I, I want to understand more about these multi-part tariffs for distributed energy resource customers that you talked about with more sophisticated time varying distribution rates. And one of the things I was asking was, you know, how are these tariffs different from what many jurisdictions have done for a while, which is differentiating demand charges between on peak and off peak hours? Um, so I think that where, the, where we're going um, is from, uh, I guess one end of the spectrum would be a volumetric, the straight volumetric charge. Um, but where we're going, and then incrementally, we're, um, that charge gets time differentiated so that we have uh, uh, on peak, off peak. Um, but I think where we're going um, eventually is having um, some portion of that charge that's time more granular and time bearing than just on peak, off peak distribution uh, demand charges, so that it varies over time. And the the, tr the challenge with doing demand charges is that um, that may not re reflect. Uh, um, uh, or, or it may oversimplify conditions on the distribution system. Um, and it may not be able, with sort of higher level demand charges, we may not be able to reflect spatial differences in the distribution system. So I think where we're going is uh, to distribution rates that are more time granular, that have higher, a uh, more spatially granular, um, but that also strike this balance between cost recovery for utilities um, and providing a way for DR customers to avoid distribution charges, because in some ways, that's what we want. But also, if all customers, are, or if large numbers of customers are avoiding distribution charges, then we have a utility cost recovery and potentially an equity problem. So I think that's the space that we have to navigate with multi-part distribution charges. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, what kinds of changes in utility incentives might help us maximize the value of distributed energy resources? And, and how does that relate to wholesale markets? 
Um, so I, I think there's a couple of different ways that, that we can think about changes in utility incentives. One I think is, is kind of the stick. Um, and the stick I, I think has to um, uh, realize that utilities um, are have their own resources or at least programmatic resources that they're using uh, to potentially reduce their, their ISO market costs. Um, and so from that perspective, if we're allowing third parties to, to, to compete alongside utilities on the distribution system, there needs to be some separation of, of utility resources um, and third party resources so that we have something more along the lines of an open access framework for the distribution system. So I think that's providing that framework and whatever it looks like, but providing that framework is, is more along the lines of the stick. Um, there's also a lot of value, and people have been talking about this for a while, but I feel like it hasn't been very focused. There's also a lot of value that utilities tend to leave on the table from DER because either they feel like it's too small or um, that it's just not something that they think a lot about. So for instance, things like reducing their congestion charges, their transmission congestion charges, or um, non-wires alternative is something that until recently utilities have, have really had little incentive to um, uh, to go after. Um, so I think changing their the utility incentive framework to, to, to push them to go after these the what these val sources of value um, is really important. But I think uh, to, to do that, I think utilities also need to be at the table um, in a conversation that is part educational, more like you know utilities, here's what what you're leaving on the table. Um, but also part negotiation. So what's the best way to, to get the right incentive framework um, just so that utilities have some ownership over it. And when, and when you say incentive framework, we're talking about financial incentives here, right? Yeah, so this could be, um, it, you know, they're uh, the, the very vague term. So it could be, you know, performance-based uh, rate making at all the way to, um, uh, to how commissions go through general rate or how commissions do rate cases. That's that's a lot. <laughs> Can you um, say more about um, you know the interconnection related barriers and how they get over it? <clears throat> One of the things you know you mentioned was curtailing you know the generation output uh, during times of lower need or, or issues on the distribution system. So um, I guess this is a plug for a pretty new Berkeley Lab report that talks about agreements. I'm not even sure if you're familiar with that report, but um, there's there's a good report about that that we that we recently put out about agreements. Um, but there's also um, the cost sharing notion, and I think Massachusetts is is a state that's been looking at the, this. You know, it's always frustrating when you know you just happen to be that project that that requires that upgrade on that part of the distribution system. And guess what? It's going to benefit a lot of other folks after that. So, could you talk a little bit more about those issues? Sure. So higher level is the cost sharing issue. And the issue here is that, and this is particularly the case with generation, is if, if you're connecting to the distribution system and you just happen to trigger some sus substation upgrade that costs $2 million, that entire $2 million may be on your shoulders. Um, so there's a couple of jurisdictions, particularly in the Northeast, that, have, that have, are starting to think about new cost sharing mechanisms. Um, that would say, you know, maybe you pay part of that $2 million, but subsequent customers would also pick up part of it. Or maybe the utility pays the $2 million up front, but then customers pay the utilities back. Um, so there's a lot of innovative thinking in the Northwest, um, particularly in Massachusetts and New York, about how to do new mechanisms for cost sharing. Um, but there's another approach to this, and this is the, uh, under the kind of flexible interconnection umbrella. So say that that what would trigger that distribution system, uh, substation upgrade would only be something that occurs in a limited number of hours per year. So why not just curtail the, the, gen, the generator who's interconnecting to the system for those hours and then let them avoid the $2 million? Um, so there's some situations in which this would make a lot of sense, but currently there's no uh, utilities don't really have ways to do this. Um, and so coming up with the framework, both it's on the interconnection side, um, allow in, in, in the interconnection study side, allowing generators and storage to come onto the system uh, when we know that they would need to trigger, otherwise trigger an upgrade, but we're going to say, uh, rather than have you pay for that upgrade, we're just going to operate you around it. Um, but then it also on the operation side, utilities have to have a way, some way of making sure that if I, you know, if I'm the utility, if I told you 
during 3 p.m., 3 to 5 p.m., I don't want you putting power onto the system. I need to have some way to ensure that you're not putting power onto the system during those time periods. So we need kind of both of those elements to, to materialize to make this work. Do you, do you mean, um, you know, an, actual, an absolute control, like a physical control? Doesn't have to be a physical control. It could be. So the utility could say, you know, if you're if you signed up for this, and the utility, um, if you signed up for a, 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 some limits on your generation, um, and the utility, you just happen to be generating at a time when the utility distribution system is constrained, the utility could directly control your resource and just lower your output. Um, but the, the utility could also just send you a signal saying, remember. I need you, or it could dispatch you, could send you a dispatch signal saying, I need you to go from 10 megawatts down to, or 10, you know, one, one megawatt down to, to 0 0.8 megawatts in over some time period. And then you, as part of your tariff, you sign up to following, follow the, the utilities instructions at penalty. If you violate the tariff, you may get kicked off the system. Right. And when you aggregate them all together, um, you know, if it was just one customer, it's it's one thing. But when you aggregate them all together, the probability of of them behaving appropriately up to you know that sort of is a, a guarantee in a sense, right? Like, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah, you can probably so, explain it better than me. So there's a the other part of this is that utilities need to have a lot more visibility. Distribution utilities right. need to have a lot more visibility on what's happening on their systems. Yeah. And, and maybe it's not, and there's a lot of, there, there are open questions about what, what level of visibility is needed. Do, you know, do utilities need to have, distribution utilities need to have like five second telemetry? Do they need to see where, where resources are every so, so many number of seconds? Or uh, can it be more, more aggregated than that? It's unclear, but, but at, at the very least utilities, distribution utilities as part of this need to have more visibility over the distribution systems. I have a couple more questions, but I, I don't see any more uh, questions in the chat box. I didn't know if anybody had raised their hands. Jessica, I, I, I didn't see anyone, but um, if you see someone who's raised your hand, their hand, could you flag them for me, please? Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll ask a couple more questions. Um, so we've talked in, in other webinars um, about distribution system operators and, and the different models that, that may exist in the future. Um, and, and the notion of, you know, some utilities are, are all snowflakes, right? They're, they're somewhat different. So to what extent should all utilities sort of converge on a model of, of distribution system operations in the future? And, um, and what should commissions be doing about this? And how should they be providing guidance and working with utilities and stakeholders over time? So I think it's it's probably unrealistic to expect all utilities to end up at a single model of distribution system operations. Um, you can see this even within a single state. So Con Ed and Central Hudson, for instance, in New York, will probably be in different different places in terms of distribution system operations in 20 years. Um, and so, from a commission perspective, the question is: We have utilities that are taking different models to distribution system operations. How can we create a single regulatory framework? that works for everybody. And so this is where I feel like coming up with this, this vision for the future and a couple of different models and transition pathways for how we get from the status quo to these different, different models of future system operations can be really useful because it may be that one utility ends up at point D, another utility ends up at point C, um, but if we have them all mapped out, um, then it's easier to create a single regulatory framework that can deal with different models. Thanks, and I, I just wanted to let folks know our workshop uh, webinar tomorrow, I've just uh, re-entered into the chat box for convenience, the registration link in case you're not uh, signed up. So this is for utilities presenting on how they plan their distribution systems, and it's a chance to ask questions directly of the utilities. Um, one more question for you, Fritz, today. Um, can you say more about distribution system congestion? A lot of us are pretty familiar with that on the transmission system and not so much on the distribution system and, and some of the trade-offs. I mean, it's all a matter of judgment, right? You know, how, how free of congestion should we make the system? How much should we pay and how do we manage these trade-offs? Yeah, so I kind of flew through this. Um, so distribution system congestion, at least at a high level, um, you can think of as analogous to, to congestion on the transmission system. So we have uh, low cost power, for instance, maybe, 
you know, we have a lot of, of um, PV in one part of the distribution system that we want to export to another part of the distribution system, but we can't because there's either a distribution line uh, constraint or a substation constraint or some form of constraint that means that we can't export that power from one part of the system to the other. Um, so in that sense, it's congestion on the distribution system can be analogous to, to congestion on the transmission system. Um, and, and the trade-offs are also really analogous. So if we wanted to, to accommodate all power at all times on the distribution system, um, and, and including all load at all times on the distribution system, it's going to be really expensive. Um, so for instance, if we wanted, um, in when we have a lot more electric vehicles on the, on the distribution system, if we want all electric vehicles to be able to charge whenever they want, uh, without any incentives to get them to move around like we, we'd want them, it's going to be extremely, extremely expensive. Um, so the question is more, how can we make the right trade-offs in terms of, of uh, operating resources and, and reducing distribution, increasing efficiency and reducing um, distribution costs? And on the other hand, expanding the distribution system to accommodate all of our DRs. I think this is for, for commissions, this is in some ways going to be the central question uh, for the next 10, 20 years. Um, and I think uh, some of this has to happen through, a lot of this has to happen through the planning process, meaning how much of the of the expansion of the distribution system is going to be made preemptively um, to accommodate new resources and how much of it is, is um, going to be triggered through interconnection. Um, but it's also going to kind of pull in the distribution operations into this process. Um, because if we can if we can increase efficiency on the distribution system by moving resources around um, to avoid distribution constraints, it means we can spend a lot less in expanding the distribution system. But it means we're going to have have to have a lot more interaction between the interconnection process, the planning process, and distribution system operations than we have in the past. And and how um, do market operations sort of figure into this? How do we help? How do we integrate markets? into this, this issue so that we're spending as little as we need to. Um, you mean wholesale markets or distribution yes, markets? Yes, I do. Uh, so for wholesale markets, I think it's the, it's the interface and the intersection that's really important. So we want to make sure that all the re that our resources on the distribution system are, are, are uh, um, uh, doing what the transmission system would want and that our resources on the transmission system are doing what the distribution system would want. And I think, the, the way that, at least at a high level, the way that we can uh, do this is through market prices. But I don't think that means that all resources on the distribution system need to participate in markets. I think we can do a lot of this through tariffs, but those tariffs have to be at least loosely connected to what utilities and, and other LSCs are getting, are paying and getting charged in the ISO markets so that there's at least some uh, connection between the two. I don't think this means that we need to have LMPs on the distribution system. I think there are ways that we can, marginal yeah, price. locational market prices on the distribution system, at least not in the near future. Um, but I do think that having this connection between the transmission and distribution systems through market, ISO market prices is really important. Well, thanks for bringing that all together at the end too. Um, thanks so much to our presenters, uh, Paul Martini, Alan Cook, Fritz Carl. Thanks to Nerook and uh, the New England uh, uh, public utility uh, commissioners for their participation. And we'll see you hopefully tomorrow for our session starting at 1 p.m. Eastern on how utilities plan distribution systems. Thanks so much. Have a good day.